It's Comics Are Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live every other Wednesday at the Ann Arbor District Library in lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. Comics.aadl.org. And this is the show where we talk with cartoonists and people in the comics, the, the field of comics about making comics, the lifestyle of a cartoonist. My name is Jersey Droz, cartoonist and teaching artist. And with me today is Chris Straub of ChrisStraub.com. K-R-I-S-S-T-R-A-U-B.com. If you haven't been there before. But who hasn't? Yeah, my parents have not. <laughs> so I hope they're listening, and I hope they check it out. I hope they go there today. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. Uh, hey, guys. <laughs> I think this is, a, this is a common complaint amongst cartoonists is Mom and Dad are the two who, uh, if you're not in the paper, you know. Have you, have you been written up in the paper, right? Did you show that to Mom and Dad? Have I been in the paper? I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's all – I mean uh, – I guess I was in the UCLA Daily Bruin, but uh, that, I don't think that counts. <laughs> that does not count. I just, I, I've told this story before, but I remember, you know, years ago I did, you know, some interesting stuff in the world of comics and, uh, you know, I'd tell my parents about it and they're like, oh, that's, that's great. That's really nice. And then I did a comics workshop in this little rinky dink town, like 30 kids, and it got written up in the, in the local paper, you know, with like a circulation of maybe like 500. And my parents were just on cloud nine, like, look, this is my kid. This is my son, the, the artist, you know. <laughs> <laughs> on print, something that means something. Something that means something, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, that, 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 that's got to be. Uh, a sticky point for you because let's go through all the stuff that you do. So it's going to inform the topic today. Uh, you're one of the post-print generation, I think, uh, as evidenced by the book that you wrote a few years back, co-wrote Web Comics Weekly, or not? Well, I mean, how, how to make web, web comics? How, yeah. how to make web comics, and then the, the podcast, the accompanying podcast, Web Comics Weekly. Uh, but I've been following your stuff since the days of the blank label comics with checkerboard nightmare the blank label mm -hmm. comics podcast which you did the theme song for you do the theme songs for a lot of things too your musician uh the chris and scott power hour daily affirmation um let's see <laughs> let's, what else we got here star slip chainsaw yes suit, yes blamimations f chords chris and scott scott and chris show right and then uh the brood hollow the new thing mm -hmm. that you're working on right right and then even the dream journals uh I'm, I was I was excited to see the Dream Journals are going on again because I remember when you were talking about it on I, it might have been on the Chris and Scott Power Hour or on the Daily Affirmations. You told this really <laughs> freaky dream where you were arguing with a ventriloquist dummy uh, from a swimming pool. Like you were at a swim, you jumped out of a window and landed in a swimming pool. Oh or something. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I remember that. It was a, it was a puppet that I was I was that was threatening me. Oh, it was a puppet. I, it wasn't a dummy. Yeah. Maybe I I put that image in my head, but. That's a you know, that's a good one to to hang on to. I actually do want to post that one again because I it's so fascinating. I like any dream that has a a narrative component because anybody can. I find that I as I get older, my dreams are mundane. Like all those interesting dreams, I don't have them anymore. Oh no! It's like it's like I was at I was at work and something didn't go right, and I <laughs> went home and I couldn't find my car, and it's like who cares? That's not a dream. I, I've had dreams like that, and I wake up even more tired after I wake up because it was just like experiencing a day of work, right? Instead of actually, right? You know, I've had those too. Yeah. <laughs> it's just why did I even bother? <laughs> why even let me rest? <laughs> but but so the point is, okay. Here's the summary statement. I'm gonna I'm gonna do something that I try to do on the show is like frame up what we're gonna talk about today. Um, you do a lot of stuff. You got a lot of interests. You got uh, a lot of different talents and uh uh you share all this stuff in a lot of different ways some of these things are for money some of these things are for your own reflection and and uh just pure pleasure of doing it uh some of the things you follow the model as espoused in the how to make web comics book of this many updates a week this is how you uh, you know generate a, an audience but then there's other things like uh, one of the things you talked about in the one of the more recent web comics weekly episodes might have been the most recent it was like in november um with Brood Hollow, you're approaching it in a little different way than you've done web comics in the past in terms of the way you update and the way you approach the storytelling. But the big idea is that you do a lot of different stuff. And uh, so there's, it's difficult to summarize you. Are you a cartoonist? Are you a musician? Are you a storyteller? That's the thing I've had the most difficulty with. Is I mean, I consider myself primarily a cartoonist. Mm -hmm. But when I feel like that doesn't cover all the stuff that I want to be able to get out there, but I mean, you're a cartoonist and you're a podcaster, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You, what do you lead with? Well, yeah, and I, I start you know? the show with cartoonists and teaching artists, right? Right. Um, and and I was I I fell into that name. I, it took me a lot of years to figure out what am I, 
because I, I teach comics classes. I do these shows to help you know broaden people's awareness of comics, and then I make comics. Uh, but the criticism gets leveled at me sometimes. Uh, well, stick to your knitting, kid. Are you a cartoonist or what? Mm -hmm. uh, you can't be both. You got to specialize. And if you don't specialize, you don't have a real job. You're a dilettante. You're fooling around. You're just monkeying with stuff, and you're a uh, jack of all trades, master of none. I'm wondering if you've ever had that level that you. How dare you? <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> Let, breaking news, everybody. I'm Chris Straub is a dilettante. <laughs> right. No, but but seriously, I mean, like, this is one of the things, like, it's it, it speaks to a common wisdom of the stick to your knitting thing that I feel like is very industrial age, 20th century kind of stuff. I, and Go ahead. I feel like there's a lot of value in it, though. I mean, I have said to myself that uh, I, I have a lot of cartoonist friends who are only cartoonists, and I look at what they're doing, and it's great. And I wish that I didn't do other stuff. Because they they have that locked down, and I and they know that if they're going to put time into something, they're going to put time into advancing that craft. Mm -hmm. Whereas I'm like, well, maybe let's try writing music again. Why not? But because maybe I could better serve myself if I just do one thing. So it's a, it was a tough thing to get over. I think only very recently have I started to embrace. No, I can do that, and I can do some of these other things. Well, you define yourself on your website as a humor scientist, which I thought was a great job description because that summarizes all the stuff, right? Yeah, and I think that it's um, – it, and even as a base uh, component, I think that humor and the, and the mechanisms of humor kind of run through everything. Oh. Uh, I had read – God, I had read a very interesting uh, article about um, uh, Tim and Eric Awesome show Great Job. It's a show on uh, Adult Swim, right? It, that was where it aired? Yeah. Um, but they, for their fifth season, and it's very, very, very absurdist, very absurdist, um, uh, and it's also very hit or miss. But for their fifth season of the show, which was the last one, it took a very dark turn, and and people were like, why? And they had said that the rhythms of horror had some of the same rhythms of comedy. Mm -hmm. And I was so fascinated by that idea that there's all this, it's like all build up and release, like and then this, it's the same structure, uh, and I th I would like to think that that runs through everything I do and everything I'm interested in. What what specifically like when you say it has the same structure? What what shared components do like as an example? Just a like, uh, shooting from the hip example of like a humor structure and a horror structure. Humor is I mean there's a lot of surprise built into humor, mm -hmm. and I think that humor is fundamentally about subverting a pattern, which is why we have the rule of threes and stuff like that. The three being the smallest number you can establish a pattern and then break it inside of. Uh, yeah. And horror is the same way. You want to set up uh, a pattern like, uh, you know, ah, I heard a scary noise. What was it? Oh, it was just the cat. Don't worry <laughs> about it. Oh, but wait, here's the scary thing. Here's the real one. Right. You, know, you need the cat first. It can't just all be <laughs> things, things jumping out at you with a knife. Right. Then it turns into that Saturday Night Live skit with the jump scares, right? Where every time right, you look right, in, the mirror, in the mirror. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have to establish that tone. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Wow. So so is that part of uh, what's informing the Brood Hollow comic? A little bit. I, I think that. Uh, I'm, I've always been charmed by that, that like 1930s cartoon aesthetic and, um, a, a book that I read, a graphic novel that I read is by a cartoonist named Max. I think he's Spanish. I think he's from Spain, but it's recent. Um, and it's called, uh, uh, Barden, the super realist. And, uh, he, uh, evokes that very 1930s sort of clean, clear line, and and especially like the hands where the fingers are open. I know that like the other popular example is the Monopoly guy, mm. Uncle Pennybags. Yeah. He has the same style drawing. Um, yeah. But I like the idea of taking that style, that simple style, and then juxtaposing it with something very realistic and very, you know, high, hopefully scary. Um, and being able to balance the two tones because I think that my strip brood hollow is scary at times, but I hope that it's more fun than it is just outright horrible. Jumping back on some language you threw out a moment ago about watching people who put their focus into their work and their craft. Mm -hmm. um, brood hollow, and I don't want to make this specifically about brood hollow, though we'll talk about it more in the second half of the show. Um, I want to use this as an example of highlighting like this this whole like pursuing multiple interests can can net some interesting results. Um, yeah. 
Brutello looks a lot different than anything else you've ever done. I mean, you're clearly playing with color in some really interesting ways, and it looks more textured, and it looks more grainy, and Star Slip didn't look like that, right? Checkerboard mm -hmm. Nightmare didn't look like that. So it's like, it's like even you're still grinding, you're still shipping, right? To use all those like popular buzz terms that people like to throw around. Uh, and there's, there's a result of this that you can hold up when you hold up Checkerboard Nightmare and you hold up Brood Hollow. It's like, well, the kid's exploring cartooning still, even though he's doing a lot of other stuff, right? Yeah. I, and I'll tell you that I have been terrified <laughs> of said exploration. I used to look at, you know, any artist will look back at their old stuff and say, oh man, this is terrible. What was I thinking? I actually, and there was a time when I thought it was good. I can't believe it. Yeah. Um, but I used that logic to think, well, five years from now, you know, even one year from now, what I'm doing now, I'll look back and think is garbage. Right. So why improve? <laughs> so, and that's why a lot of my old stuff is very sprite driven because I thought, look, I can get it to a place where I'm comfortable with what it looks like. It doesn't have to look better than this. And it's not going to look better than this because if it does, I'll always go back and say, oh, this is terrible. So I didn't want to evolve. I was scared to, because I didn't want to confront that to get better means that at one time you were worse. Is that, is that vain? Is that, that uh, no. Well, <laughs> cartooning is a personal act, right? We can't separate ourselves from that. And that's something you've talked about extensively on shows with Scott Kurtz, mm -hmm. uh, with Web Comics Weekly guys. Um, you can't depart, you can't pull yourself away from that personal aspect. More of it. So, now than ever, especially now with the internet, where if, if interacting with your audience is so critical to, mm -hmm. you know, you having a living, people want to know who you are. Yeah. All right. So um, what I was saying was... Um, so I grew up on superhero comics like a lot of people my age, and um, one of the things that I got accustomed to is when a cartoonist would come onto the book and work on it for a year, you'd look at their first issue of that run, and it looked one way, and then you look at it like a year later, it looks another way. And it, as a fan, both, both were valid. I was like, oh, well, the old stuff looks different, but the new stuff looks, you know, he's loosened this up or he's trying out this kind of incline. But my point is, is that... Doesn't it seem like by allowing yourself to change, you're also accepting the fact that there's going to be people who his old stuff was better, dude. You know, their first album was the better album, and then they changed. So it's like you're still maintaining a readership. It's just that, you know, the, there's going to be people who gravitate to different eras of your career differently. Like Schultz did this. Schultz stuff changed a lot for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. No, so, I think that that's fair. And I think that the more that um, you get an audience to buy into who you are as opposed to what your work is specifically – they're going to be more understanding and they may, may even be appreciative and enjoy seeing that growth and say, ah, I remember when uh, all he did was this thing and now it's in color and now it's, you know, <laughs> although when I read comic books, I, I mean, I remember, uh, you know, a, a new artist coming on board and opening up the first page and I'm like, ah, God, this guy, this type of thing. <laughs> That is not what I wanted. <laughs> How many months of this do I got to endure? <laughs> Well, that, but that's a different bag because then you're talking about a licensed character, or rather, uh, a franchise yeah, character, rather than a one one artist. That's true, right? But I mean, you you're representing that that uh, future of comics. I think where you, you just use the language like it's it. You are the thing that the people follow, right? I mm -hmm. I read these comics because it's a, it's a Chris Straub joint, as they say, right? Um, but I want to I want to back up. And I want to talk about this idea of getting to being able to say I'm a humor scientist hmm. and uh, not to refute the whole sticking to your knitting criticism necessarily, because I think what's interesting about that is you get to say if, if, if we accept their their notion that one should stick to their knitting, then the challenge becomes to find out what your knitting is. That was the language you used in the email to me that really just made all the lights turn on. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah, this is about finding what your venue, your platform is. Um, and I'm curious, this is where I'll lead with this first thought. You do a lot of different kind of stuff. Have you ever observed, and if so, how did it, how did it do this, uh, how working on something like the Blamimations or working on your music or working on doing stand-up uh, or any of these things, how have any one of these things contributed to or informed or affected one of the other things that you've done? Has the comics ever been affected by some of your other pursuits? Oh, sure. I mean, I think that the fact that I'm doing a light horror strip, but even to where I would consider that a possible genre to go into, mm. is informed by my interest in it. Um, 
uh, hmm, I'm losing the thread of the of the question a little bit. Yeah, I know. I, I, here, I, I, here I'm thinking that like, no, of course I do things I'm interested in. <laughs> like, <laughs> why would I not? What do you do? Uh, no, I think that if anything, I've learned that, um, you know, to go back to speaking to a uh, personal voice that I've only, and maybe I'm very lucky in this regard, but I've only been um, rewarded for putting more of my voice into something. I think that um, uh, you can, hmm, I'm going to, a, a horrible metaphor just came to mind, but I'm going to just tough it out with you and you stick through it with me. Okay. Right. My, uh, my favorite band is Electric Light Orchestra. Love Electric Light Orchestra. Great, great Zoom guys. is a great album. Yeah, it's pretty good. Oh, no. <laughs> it's too, look, Jeff Lynn went too far into, I wish I was a, a rock and roll guy in the late 50s. He went too far. Yeah. He, that's when he wanted to be born. But he, <laughs> but he pioneered all this other stuff. Yeah. Anyway, um, so he did that, uh, Jeff Lynn fronted that band until he got tired of it and he wanted to move on and he did. And all of his bandmates uh, said, wow, you can't kill our cash cow. This is good stuff. What are we supposed to do? We want to keep being ELO. And, and Jeff said, all right, I guess you can if you give me a fee and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, the music that Jeff wrote was his music. That was his voice. When all the other guys were still ELO, but Jeff was not in the band anymore, they had to write to that aesthetic. That was not their voice, and their albums are not great. Um, because you can tell that they're trying to play it off. They're trying to fake it. Mm. Um, and uh, to come back to this conversation, uh, if anything, I've been rewarded for being looser and letting myself put more of myself in there as opposed to say, well, the last strip I did was science fiction, so I guess the next thing I do has to be science fiction or it has to have a certain... Uh, uh, punchline style, or like it has to be very verbose. Like Starslip was very wordy, mm -hmm. um, and I and I could have stuck myself with that and said, "Well, I guess that's what people want." Mm -hmm. uh, but it would have there would have been a falseness to it because again, it's like I'm not letting myself explore anything or evolve into another thing. Well, and what you're speaking to is something that makes me bristle when people throw the criticism of stick to your knitting is they're trying to throw... I, I, I heard a marvelous description of what email is recently, and that actually ties into my point here, is that your email is the inbox or is the to-do list that everybody else has control over. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, could you just please do this thing? Thanks, I knew that you could. Um, right. And it, then they tick it off. And then, on <laughs> I put it in his lap, he's good. Yeah. Uh, and, and somebody throwing stick to your knitting at you is them saying, here's my definition of who you are and what your job is. Uh, mm -hmm. You're clearly not staying within those parameters. Please reconsider. Uh, please advise uh, uh, at the end of the email. Um, but what you're talking about, and forgive me for using this tired old cliched phrase, but there's like an honesty with who you are and what you want that you're responding to rather than some kind of imposed definition that you're picking up from outside sources. Does that sound fair to say? Um, yeah, I think so. I think that, um, I think a lot of it too is the idea that if you, when you're exploring these things, you are either going to be rewarded by them or you are not, right? Mm. Nobody likes to stick with something that they actually don't have any aptitude for. <laughs> Uh, my problem has always been, and this is going to sound vain, or this is going to sound uh, the opposite of humble, which it, uh, but it's true because I am great. Uh, <laughs> I, I've never, uh, or the things that I have tried, I have failed at stuff. Absolutely, I have. But most of the time, I think, I want to try this. And it turns out, okay. You know what I mean? It turns out just good enough to where it's like, oh, great. Now I have another interest. Yeah. As opposed to, well, that was horrible. I'll never do that again. Now that I've done, I've, I've done that. You you mentioned stand up, which I've never done. Oh, um, I thought you did improv before. I've done improv. Oh, which is different. That's true. Okay. Stand up is a fundamentally terrifying proposition <laughs> for me. I, uh, but improv is is almost as terrifying. I've done improv, and I've, I feel like there's a component of improv and even what we're doing right here. Yeah, sure. Um, and I did a great, I thought uh, we we're very proud of uh, improv podcast with uh, David Malky of Wondermark. Tweet, uh, tweet me harder. I forgot yeah. that in the rundown of your credits. I apologize. Yes. Um, tweet me harder. It was great. During, when, during that show though, there was a, we were trying to structure the Chris and David characters of the show, you know, who were almost 80% 
us, except with some absurdity on top. Uh -huh. The question was, are we just discussing these crazy things or is the conceit that we actually did them? <laughs> you know, how much do you want to go buy into that? Um, but it's always been the case where it's like, we could have done that show and it could have been terrible from yeah. the get go. And we would have said, God, all right, I guess there's no way to do it. This is not what we're good at, but it's just good enough that it's encouraging, you know? And that's, I mean, that's a good thing. That's a great thing. I would never want to shut anybody down, uh, trying something that they enjoy, that they are finding that they're, that they they're good at. Do you think setting some initial parameters is helpful in exploring something new like that? Because you just said that you said you and Dave had a discussion, right? You didn't just say, let's do an improv show where people say things to us and we respond to it. Go, right? You had a yeah. discussion about what's the nature of this thing first. There was an analysis there. No, absolutely. I mean, we want to know. I think, I think the important thing there is consistency. Like at some point you have to say, all right, this was good, but can I do it again? Uh, you know, is there a mechanism to it that I can that I can work inside of, or that I can exploit, or, and do I know what that is? Can I, you know, can I make it the best thing that it that it can be, and what does that look like? Mm -hmm. um, I think that you do have to place those parameters on yourself to where you tell yourself, okay, what would I consider the line that I step across, and that is success at this thing. Mm -hmm. And in the past, I never, I had never set those for myself. And um, I think ha having those is what converts a hobby into maybe a livelihood. So but before I started to get traction with any of these things, I ended up with a lot of hobbies. <laughs> and uh, I did, um, to bring up another one, does it sound, to your listeners, does it sound invented? <laughs> I'm just throwing up things that you haven't mentioned that I also have done. <laughs> I... <laughs> For a, for a while, in like 2007, 2008, I was obsessed with this idea that um, I would run a, um, a horror a microfiction site and that it would, be, it would take place in one town and that everybody would – you could contribute stories, but they had to take place in the town. And you could add to the lore of the town and build this thing. Um, and I did it for a little bit and um, some good stuff came out of it and I had contributors and they did good stuff. And was this Iker Falls? It was Iker Falls, yeah. And I was very pleased with it. Um, however, at the time, I should have been focusing on other stuff, specifically uh, re uh, revenue generation. Okay. But I would find myself drawn to, uh, ah, I got to make the site look better. I got to do this. I got to write that story. I got to finish it. But there was never a, well, why do I have to finish it? What is it doing for me currently? If there's a value in it ultimately, and I think that, I mean, there is, there's absolutely value in exploring art for art's sake, mm -hmm. but I consider myself a commercial artist and I ultimately want to make a living with what I do. And I made sure actually, um, in brood hollow to build that into the, to the device of it. I, I fully acknowledge that I could have tried it and it could have been not great or maybe people were not interested in it. And I structured it such that, uh, it has a first book first chapter that will end it's all we're almost two-thirds of the way through it at this point um but i built it so that if people like it i can proceed after that but if there's not enough interest well at least i'll be able to say i got one complete thing out of it and that's something i, I tried for a while something with a, a sense of there's a, a an ultimate unit i'm going for here yeah i didn't want to start it and then I did that with F chords. I started it and it was great for a while. I liked it and then I soured on it and I stopped doing it and there was no end. So it's just like this and my past is littered with projects where I started it and I got real excited about it and then it just died and I didn't put any kind of a button or ribbon on it in, and in, it's just there. In the later half of the latest Web Comics Weekly, you guys talked about this a little bit and I thought it was really interesting because it speaks to, like, you know, five years ago, the wisdom was you get yourself a, uh, an intellectual property that you can build around yourself as your quote-unquote brand, to use that kind of talk, mm -hmm. um, and you write it. <laughs> and and uh, I, I, I did a podcast for four years with some friends that got some traction, became pretty popular with people, and then we decided to end it. 
You know, it was like it, it felt like, like it was done. You know, but we didn't know when we started out. It's like when we started out, it just felt like this is just gonna go and go and go, and who knows where it will go. But after ending that thing and feeling the relief of. I got a lot of other options open to me now. I can try a lot of other different things I've always been meaning to, but in the parameters of that last project, I couldn't do it. Yeah. Uh, and it made me realize that, you know, I wonder how much, um, how, how, what kind of legs this idea has of thinking of projects as having definitive endings when you start out. So if I'm going to do a podcast, it's a podcast series. It's season one, two, three, four, we're done. You know, yes, uh, yes. That's how we did Tweet Me Harder ultimately. Yeah. We said, let's do it in seasons. We'll do 10 and we'll see how they how it feels and when if we like it we'll keep going um i think that's really smart because it also i mean it, it it's something that i've i haven't i don't plan ahead when i write or at least i haven't planned ahead in the past when i've written and with star slip which was a story strip at the to wrap it up was like all right what did i do <laughs> what have i done right uh and and uh, had i considered it a finite project i think it would have been a lot easier to make uh really tight um and so i mean i'm excited to be doing a strip where i've 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 done that i've built in this idea that okay i've written the whole thing ahead of time yeah. and i know where it should go does that change the way that you structure the updates and the the for lack of a better term strips the pages <laughs> i think there's a lot of um some people i think this is interesting um when we wrote uh uh, so Scott Kurtz, Dave Kellett of SheldonComics.com, Brad Geiger of Eagle, uh, Eagle, Evil-Comic.com, <laughs> um, uh, and myself, when we wrote How to Make Web Comics, we were writing How to Make Web Comics for, uh, based on what we had learned. And it was very much like a daily gag-a-day updates. And people would say, how do I do long form? How do I make a story strip work? And we would say, well, you know, you have to build a beat in that's interesting in each update. So if, you, if you're doing once weekly, there's got to be something in the last panel or, you know, that will get people to come back. And it's, that's actually kind of limiting as a storytelling device, too. And now that I'm doing a, a long form strip where it's not as important uh, to have that built in. Because I'm focused on having it be a good book as opposed to a good, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And I'm trying, I haven't broken it yet, but I'm trying to build in the idea that um, if I have to miss an update day because I feel like what is going to go up, you know, I got started late or whatever. Mm -hmm. if, what, if what's going to go up tomorrow is going to be bad, then I will not put it up. Like I want the book to be good. I don't want to look back and say, oh, this is a bad page. This is a bad one. Right. Um, and I think to go back to the commerce, the driver for that is that uh, – advertising money has dropped in okay. the last year or two. So to have that like rigid, I mean, you still want to build a ritual experience for people to come back to your site and not forget to come back. But yeah. the idea of getting that page view every day <laughs> is not as important when the ad money is not there. So I think, I think that actually helped to, okay, well, what can I explore that's not based on getting somebody to ping the site every day? Right. Like one of the things that I did a, a long form comic back in 2007 um, from 2007 to I think it ended then. But anyway, um, and I did think about like, well, how can I use the traditional idea of the page turn tease? Mm -hmm. Have everything end in a way that you got to find out what happens next. Yeah, um, that was that was there. But I was early on. I realized I'm never going to get real page views where I can make ad money off of this thing because I'm doing it once a week. It's not. It's not entirely humor based. Um, you know, it's it's not that. It doesn't have that stickiness that a humor strip has. Um, for you know, and not to you know disparage the work. It was good work. It's just that it didn't fit these kinds of traditional parameters. So mm -hmm. then I thought, well, what is this? Well, this is a print book first, a web comic second. Yeah, yeah. And thinking about what is the ultimate object you're making at the end is this a web comic first and a book second? Is this a book first and a web comic second? And that can help inform like, well, how do I approach? the ideas within right yeah and i think absolutely you can do a a, a strip that's a gag a day that doesn't have any like uh, end product in mind where you're like i'll do 80 and that's a book and then i'll see how it is you can go you know as much as you want that's fine uh but 
for a long form. I don't, I don't think it's as effective. It's just like, <laughs> well, I got to come up with something for Friday. That's, right. <laughs> that's where I was. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I feel your pain there. I was, I was doing some, I tried doing two updates a week for a while uh, on a full page style, you know, seven panels a page, crowd scenes, the whole bit. And uh, it, 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 it quickly, I, I think I lost three years of my life doing that just for one summer <laughs> of doing that. Uh, it just, you just it, come out white. <laughs> I was like, I was like, I drank from the wrong chalice in the third Indiana Jones movie. <laughs> Um, but going, I want to, I want to back up just a little bit to talking about this. You talked about commerce being one of the measurement tools of knowing whether, you, you know, what this thing, ha if this thing has legs, you talked about a little bit having parameters to be able to determine, be able to measure if this thing has legs. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to get at this idea of like the difference between a dilettante and what's the term renaissance man i don't know but the, the person who has multiple That's, fields that sounds so foppish it does <laughs> oh <laughs> i mean and i've thought about like how do i describe myself do i say renaissance man no don't ever say that. <laughs> don't ever say renaissance. don't tell anybody you're that yeah you sell a hedonism bot right <laughs> uh but uh you know it's like it's like I'm just trying to figure out like a litmus test because, you know, there's a lot of people who follow the show are young or beginning cartoonists, even if they're like, you know, older, but they're just starting out in cartooning. And they're like, well, how do I know that I'm being a dilettante or if I'm actually getting some value out of this thing? And like, you know, when you're just starting out, you're not making money off of it right away unless you're like supremely lucky. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're starting a new thing out, like I want to... Correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you posted a, a blog post recently where you were kind of reflecting on 2012, and you said, yeah, you, you stated goals, and then you publicly, which I thought is so great, you publicly said whether you passed or failed on it, and you gave reasoning why. And mm -hmm. this wasn't any kind of like, oh, I failed, I'm no good, everybody, please, you know, throw some praise on me to make me feel better about this. It's more like this really critical review of your year. Do you do this with every project? Do you do, set up like a, here's the goal? whether it's to make money or to get this value out of it, like some kind of artistic value, and then there's some review process in there, or is this something you only do once a year, or am I just making up stuff now? I, I never did that. <laughs> <laughs> like, whose blog was that? that was <laughs> How much did you prepare for this? Uh, I read your I Wikipedia did, page. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I did write a... Um, I don't do it on a per-project basis. I was doing it, like, on, and only for the past two years have I done this year-end wrap-up. Mm -hmm. uh, and partly, and it grew out of, um, I want to remember what I did this year, mm -hmm. uh, just to be able to reflect on it and think about like, oh yeah, that was cool. I like that. And then as I got into that mindset of, of reviewing my year, I thought, well, maybe I should talk about even the bad stuff. Maybe I should talk about whether or not it worked or why, you know, if it didn't work, why not? And, uh, I mean, it's probably a good idea to do it per project. <laughs> now that you mention it, I think per project you you have to set a um, um, I mean you set that goal and in my case it would be you know can it attract an audience can I are they interested do I feel like they would spend money on it not to make me sound like a monster but come on. <laughs> uh, I hate I, that it always turns into that. We always have to feel like right. we back up and say, like, look, I'm not trying to abuse and manipulate no. the public, but I got to eat, folks. Right. I'm providing a service. Right. I'm providing, we provide entertainment for people. So right. why can't I be paid to do so? Um, I think getting over that is so important. Uh, but my, my, the point I was trying to make was that in trying to determine whether or not you're doing something of value, I think. Number one, you have to be patient. And I think the, the thing we've seen the most of uh, where we can be critical of a new cartoonist is, um, you know, I've been doing my strip for six months and there's been, you know, no appreciable whatever. And it's like six months. Like I did it for six years before I saw, it, you know, anything like the the I was very excited for the audience I had for uh, Checkerboard Nightmare, which was the first strip I did. Um, but I had done it for five years and I had done it because I like doing it. Um, I wasn't looking at it like, what, why is the readership so low compared to whatever? Yeah. Um, I think you have to be self-critical and, uh, about it. And, uh, I've lost the thread again. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but <laughs> I, I have a, a bad habit of layering six questions into one. Um, it just give me yes or no's from now on. From this point <laughs> on. <laughs> I'll do it all day. <laughs> we'll fit a lot of content into this episode that yeah. way. Um, no, but but 
I want I want to find this balance of being critical and finding value by reflecting on something. Um, because being being critical means that you're being uh, analytical about what results you netted from the thing. Um, but then also, it's like you can take that to uh, such an extreme where you say, well, I played trombone in high school, and I'd kind of like to do it again. Eh, well, it's been a long time. I don't see how I can make a buck off of that immediately. Why do it? Right? So you can— So that's that's the opposite or the far end where you're like, I won't even try anything new. Yeah, yeah. Because when will I see the return? Right. I think that, I mean, if the return is that important to you, then I guess you should not do it. <laughs> but I think also that I've been saying, I think a lot. Uh, <laughs> I, um, you have to, I, I believe huh? that there's, that there's a turning point in a project where you go from a genuine enjoyment of it to now you start to skew into when am I going to see some good come out of this? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think there are a lot of people and myself included where you do a project and, um, that latter part actually starts to take precedence. And now you, there's some enmity for this project. There's some, there's some anger and it's like, I don't see why, you know, especially when you start getting jealous of other artists. Oh, why, why are you reading that? Mine's just as good. <laughs> why don't I have that readership? <laughs> And if this stuff, if that thinking starts to dominate the project, then maybe you need to evaluate whether or not it's worth doing. I, you know? I would submit, correct, you know, feel free to refute this, Chris, mm. but I would submit that probably when you've done as many projects as you've done, it's okay for that to become a little bit more in the forefront because it's not a, when you set up to do something like, oh, I'm going to do this comic called Brute Hollow. It's not a question of can I do it? Mm -hmm. Right. You know, you can deliver on it. So now, like up front, it's like, well, can I also make it worth my while to do? Whereas when you're starting trombone after not having done it for 10 years or 20 years, uh, it's not the, the question is, can I even do it? Can I even play this thing to any kind of satisfaction? Right. So, yeah, that's not the time to be thinking about the money. Right. No, absolutely. It's not the time you start. I mean, I think it's a great idea to set a goal, but mm -hmm. maybe the goal is, is quality based as opposed to you know, finance or audience size, like how, how good, like what's the metric for being good at this? And realistically, when can I expect to see that? And you start with that. Um, but I mean, in the beginning, we, we would give this advice all the time to people and it's kind of our in joke now. It's like, when do I make t-shirts? Yeah. Uh, because we'd get that. It's like, I've got three weeks of strips in, you know, when do I start making t-shirts with the logo of the strip <laughs> on it? It's like, ne never, number one, never. <laughs> Because nobody wants that shirt. Right. I would not make that shirt. Uh, but you don't make merchandise until there is a um, uh, until there's a demand for it, and you and you can tell there's a demand for it. You don't worry about not knowing when. You know, yeah. you won't do it. You, there's no such thing as waiting too long. You can only start way too early. Chris, when will I know I've met the right girl? That's what I, I don't know. You know, feel it in your heart. <laughs> Just, just let that, let it speak to you. Uh, <laughs> just, uh, that's, I'm married and I keep asking myself the same thing. <laughs> but, do I, but do I know? But, but do that's I what know? sucks about those kind of questions, right? Because like, you can't give an answer of like, well, she's going to be this tall and she's going to have this kind of accent. And... Like, oh, look, I know I met the right girl, but do I know? No. Right. <laughs> do I like her? Like her? Do I like her? Like her? Um, uh, what was the, oh shoot, I had a, uh, um, it was about merchandise. It was about that. Making the t-shirt with your logo on it and when do I do it? When you have mm -hmm. an audience who can support it? No, oh, that's what it was. So um, uh, a, f a favorite concept of mine is uh, cargo cults. Have you seen this stuff? No. You familiar with this? No. Oh man, absorb this because it's so <laughs> great. Um, and it's very sad. Um, <laughs> But in the uh, somebody who knows the Wikipedia entry better than me is going to get mad at me for m messing it up. But um, in World War II, in the Pacific Rim, uh, we America, I mean, in Japan too, we would set bases up on islands, right? And the, and the indigenous people of those islands were like, "Who are these guys?" And we said, "Look, we got to set up base here, but here's food and here's cool stuff, and you know." We'll we'll get out of your hair in a couple of years. Yeah, and, and they did. Um, but the people who lived there, it, it became a religion for them. And 
the idea that a plane comes and brings goods uh, became so ingrained that they started building runs um, out of, uh, you know, straw and... I thought you were going to say human rods. skulls or something. No, no, no. no. They, were, <laughs> they would build runways and they would have a guy stand out there and like, you know, do the signals and all that. Wow. With the expectation that a plane would come and bring some stuff again and the good, we'll have the good old days back. Yeah. Um, of course, that doesn't work. So I, uh, the thing that we were telling people is to not run your work like a cargo cult where it's like, okay... I've I'm started the comic, but who cares about that? I've got the site design I want. I've got the merchandise in the in the hopper. It's ready to roll. I'm going to do conventions. I'm going to start my own podcast. I'm going to start doing all this stuff. And the work is actually last on the list of things to do with the expectation that if you have the appearance of this, uh, this engine, this device, that it will function like that device, which is not true. So as, especially at the beginning, you have to work on... I mean, it's like, when do I put advertising on my site? At yeah. the beginning, don't. There's no point. I mean, leave holes for it. Yeah. You can sign up with AdSense, but you're not going to see any money from it. You, it doesn't need to be there yet. You should be worrying about the work you're making. You are a pro because you've set up the segue for where I wanted to go next. Uh, God, this is good. <laughs> you, the, there was language you used early on in this episode where you said, mm -hmm. I'm terrified of said exploration. And what you just described is... Very, very scary. There's no guarantees. You can set up all the things that all the SEO gurus tell you to. Oh, it's comforting, right? Yeah, it's very comforting. But what you're describing is a world where I, I am always, always having to be on guard and looking for the thing that delights me and then finding, simultaneously finding a way to spread that delight on in a way that can generate <laughs> income for me, uh, redefining myself on a consistent basis, and... You know, one of the things that I think this this leads into the segue of because like it's like well then, you must be like you know Macho Man Randy Savage man you must be the manliest dude who ever lived because you've navigated these waters and faced that terror on a regular basis. But I wanted to dive into something that you also posted on your review blog about being nicer because this is and this is where I get to make you a little uncomfortable by complimenting you a little bit, Chris. Uh -oh. I know it sucks. It uh -oh. sucks being told how <laughs> how you're good at something. Um, you know, you've been involved in some serious internet kerfuffles in the past that nobody probably remembers anymore because they were internet kerfuffles, after all, mm -hmm. right? I remember some of the yeah. days of the Comicspedia fights that would happen. Uh, oh, wow, <laughs> yes. I forgot about that one. <laughs> that was when I was first starting web comics, and I remember looking at those going like, I don't know if I want into this thing because everybody's so bad all the time. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> things have calmed down a little bit since then. But but one of the, 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 the guiding things that I think is consistent amongst all of your interactions, for, uh, regardless of all of the different projects you've done, is that you've always been a very thoughtful and critical person, but also a very gentle person with your targets. I mean, even when you're in a fight, I never felt like you were ever doing dirty pool on anybody. And so it, it struck me when I was reading your blog that one of your goals was being nicer, and you, you used the phrasing, you don't want to dump on things to your own detriment. And this yeah. is where we get into a little bit of this, like, this ties into the commerce thing. This ties into the whole maintaining a presence through projects. What mm. do you mean by that? How is it dump? Because I've heard once, and this may be a tired old thing, you know, humor is an act of, of aggression in a way. You're, you're lampooning something. You're sending it up. You're pointing out the, the, crit the critical flaws in the thing when you're make, uh, making a joke about it. Uh, so, of course, if you're making fun of something, you're making fun of something. How can that be detrimental to you? Because of the, because I think that, Oh, God, Chris, stop it. Uh, <laughs> speak with some confidence. Courage of your convictions, man. Yeah. Um, when, you make, uh, when you make fun of a thing, uh, the people who like that thing also feel that they've been made fun of. Mm -hmm. If I don't like a thing, uh, like I've come out against memes a lot. I get mad about memes. I don't like that type of humor. I don't like... Um, I don't like the idea that in stand up comedy, if you, the, the guy who was just on goes off stage and then you come on and you tell the same jokes, you get booed. But if yeah. it's a meme, your applause is actually louder than his. <laughs> and the guy who comes on after you, we're going to love him even more. And I, it does not make sense to me. Um, and, but people got mad at that and they were, they were upset. Uh, Specifically, and this I thought it was a fascinating comment from somebody on Twitter. They said, what do you have against the democratization of humor? And memes 
to this person at least, and I'm sure for a lot of people, it's like, oh, are you a comedian? You're a funny guy? Guess what? I could be funny too. Hmm. Uh, You're not so clever, are you? Like, well, you don't get to hold on to that. I can do it too, and I want to do it too. Mm -hmm. So why should you be the purveyor of stuff that's funny? And then I would say, because your stuff is not funny. It's not <laughs> because I'm funny and you're dumb. I'm the font from which all humor uh, sprouts and grows. Right, right. right. So, <laughs> but I don't want to – when that stuff comes up, I, uh, I mean I still feel that way about memes where I think there's a point at which it is funny. And then it dramatically – as soon as it gets to the masses where everybody's just pounding on it and it starts showing up on T-shirts, it's not – it's – now it's dead. He but I don't want to come out every time a meme shows up and yell at it. <laughs> well, then you're the public access TV guy, right? There they go there, again. <laughs> yeah, but, but there is a direct um, benefit to it. And the way that I always describe, or the way that I described that was, you can. I've wanted to make a shirt or a poster or something that makes fun of memes, mm -hmm. and I can. But the person who makes the poster that doesn't make you feel dumb for liking something will. Mm sell many more of that than I will of hey, you should feel stupid for what you enjoy that's right. a, not a good thing to say to anybody yeah it's, we all have different opinions there's just there's no reason for me to to vent that one so True. much if it's fun I mean I think there's humor in that type of of venting but not when it's you can tell when it ticks over from you know, I'm just doing this for laughs to, no, I'm, there's a kernel of truth in it. I'm very angry about this and I'm a bitter old man. Yeah. Just let me rant. That's not appealing. That That's a, that's a really lovely way of putting it. Yeah. And, and it's, it, long time listeners of the show know that I'm a huge, huge fan of kids cartoons from my youth. And one of the things that I bristle and get really defensive about is when people say like, oh, Voltron doesn't hold up. And I'm like, hold up to what? And I won't go any further than that because that's, my, that's the basis of my argument. Um, <laughs> It uh, doesn't hold up to 40-year-old me. You know, <laughs> Six-year-old me loved it. but It doesn't hold up to Anna Karina, so therefore it must not be very good. Uh, ne never mind that it was aimed at kids and everything. But but the, 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 the problem I think that I'm responding to there is that they're saying it's dumb and you should feel dumb for liking it rather than – when I talk about it with my friends who love Voltron, I'm like, wasn't it dumb when, you know, the space mice did this thing? That was such silly writing, right? And it's yeah. it, we love it, but we're making fun of it at the same time in, in the kind of loving yeah, it's parody. Like, I can make fun of my brother. Don't you dare make fun of him. You don't know him. <laughs> <laughs> but going back, that's kind of related to what I'm talking about here. I'm, what I'm saying is like there's like a difference between naming somebody's faults with affection. Right, rather than naming somebody's faults as an aggressive act, does that make mm -hmm. sense? Oh, this is a great topic. I love it um, because to me, it's not about um, making fun of something as an aggressive move. Uh, I'm going to deploy another thing that people who know me have heard me say many times. But one of my favorite things was uh, uh, an interview with Christopher Guest, who did, uh, you know, This Is Spinal Tap and mm -hmm. all those mockumentary type comedy films, and he was doing. Uh, a Mighty Wind, which was about folk music and that world. And the interviewer said, you do so, you, you really ripped the guts out of these, these subjects. Why did, what made you, what inspired you to just take an absolute dump on folk music and just show the world how dumb this music is and how stupid these people are? And he's like, I love folk music. I was <laughs> raised with folk music. That's why I made this movie. I'm not making fun of it to show that it's awful. Like, you can make fun of anything. Uh, and I think that in uh, parody, like there's a lot of love that goes into it too. And I think it's a really, it's a high art form it, in calling out the flaws of a thing. Mm -hmm. um, you had to have paid attention enough to know those flaws. Oh, and that's great. When you, when you pay attention to a thing that much, you know, you probably do love it. So I don't feel like parody is innately a cruel act. Um, and just and in the same way, I don't feel like making fun of a thing is an innately cruel act. It just depends on what the what the purpose of it is. Ah, uh, that is a lovely unboxing of that statement on your blog. I love it. That is great. So yeah, so that 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 answers that question for me. Uh, we, we're going to do book recommendations in just a minute, but I want to talk about uh, Brood Hollow a little bit more in detail. So okay, this is the new book 
we talked about, you know, it's got you've got an ending in mind. You wrote it in advance. When you say you wrote it in advance, do you mean outline it or it, have you thumbnailed it's all, the entire it's thing? It's all outlined. Yeah. I did a couple things recently where uh, I got some advice from a friend of mine, uh, Mikey Newman, who wrote a book called The Returners. Um, but I was trying to decide how much because I do have a long arc for Brood Hollow, but I was trying to decide how much to put in this first segment. And he told me, which I thought was super useful. He said, don't save. Don't tell me that you have a trilogy and there's a lot of cool stuff in movie number two and three. Show me cool stuff now and think of new cool stuff for the second one. Like, do it now. Don't tell me, well, you, you have to have watched the first one to enjoy the second one. So let me get through this garbage oh, in the first one. Um, I'm guilty and, of that. <laughs> no, so but that's how I was doing Brood Hollow. I'm like, I got a lot of cool stuff I want to get to, but I got to establish all this groundwork. And yeah. I was trying to keep it very straight and narrow. So it's outlined, but I'm letting myself have room to go, you know what, I'm going to include this. I'm going to put this in there uh, and see if I can make it fit. Yeah. Um, so, it, yeah, that's how I, it feels better for me to write from outline as opposed to, you know, nail the dialogue for every strip for the next three weeks. And this is the convergence of humor and horror that we were talking about earlier, uh, where your main character, Wadsworth Zane, is in this town where mm -hmm. every kind of supernatural thing exists. Uh, maybe <laughs> <laughs> but he has a lot of he has a lot of problems yeah. oh man and, and you know I, I was joking earlier about going to your Wikipedia page but just out of curiosity I went to it just before we started recording and I was reading what Wikipedia said about Brood Hollow I thought this was great uh, I don't know how true this is but is is somewhat based on Straub's own superstitions and fears of the paranormal I did not know this that you were that freaked out about ghosts well, here's the thing. I'm not actually freaked out about ghosts. I am freaked out that I will see a ghost. <laughs> There's a distinction. The distinction is that if I do see a ghost, then I know I'm crazy. And what do I do? I don't think the ghost is real, but I do think that I am now insane. <laughs> and that's worse for me. But I had a lot of beliefs about about ghosts and, and that kind of OCD, like the pattern that that in the story he mm -hmm. relies on to keep him safe, which his doctor thinks is nonsense yeah. is up, is uh, taken largely from patterns that I, over time, <laughs> you know, I ritualize certain things. It's OCD. Absolutely. It's where, yeah. you know, I touched the doorknob three times today and I didn't die today. So, so maybe why not touch it tomorrow <laughs> the same way? Just be safe. Why not? Uh, um, yeah. It's yeah. The specious, the specious logic of the OCD, uh, character but yeah that's that's the character who's in this world and again i think anybody who's been familiar with any of your other work like chainsaw suit or um star slip is going to be pleasantly surprised when they see this book because it's it's like nothing else that you've ever drawn um really it looks like you're you're, you're taking your time with the the color usage in this thing and the textures and everything i i want to i think there's a lot of um um it, it, I, I am using textures from the internet that are like uh, for commercial use and they're free to and not licensed. I'm not like grabbing. St I'm not stealing stuff from DeviantArt. Oh, admit it. You got it off place. a Tumblr and then you removed Oops. attribution. <laughs> <laughs> then you just went like that, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, but you're going to, so you're going to come clean and change it now? No. Uh, that's my process. I'm <laughs> that's your process. Uh, but um, yeah. I, what I really like about it is that uh, the ones I'm using are there's there's um, they're not flat, um, they're not grayscale rather. They're not uh, they have color um, gradients in them, and part of what I enjoy is having a pattern or a texture rather line up with a part in a panel. So rather than just slapping the thing down. If if I want to call attention to something, I want the texture there to be evocative in some way, um, and I I feel like that's sort of the least of what I'm doing on there because it is ultimately something I found, but I didn't want to just go, like, yeah, yeah, I want to make it look old, <laughs> right. you know. Well, that... I'm very I'm very excited to be doing color. I've been afraid of color for a long time. Afraid of color. Because uh, ghosts come from color, uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, because well, number one, I was afraid of color because I had heard that color printing, and it is, is more expensive than black and white. And I've always been, well, what do I do when I 
finish this color thing that I'm proud of and I can't print a book because it's expensive. Yeah. But that's that's changed because it's come down. Um, but also, I, you know, I've never taken art classes, so I don't understand color. Like, I don't know color theory. I don't, I don't, mm. I, and I know there's a right way to do it. I know Some people there's say. a way. Well, okay. But I know that there are people who would look at what I've done and go, no, 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 come on. You know, that's, yeah. that's not the way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so as, that, as people on the internet do though, sometimes, and I'm not to, not to like, you know, poop on color theory or anything, but there's also the sense that, you know, you've done a lot of web comic strips. You've been to art school, right? You, you no, cranked, I have not done art school. But you, in, in the form of, <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's why I'm so afraid. When are people going to learn that it's all fake? Oh, of course. Yes. Um, um, this is the day everybody finds out that you're a fraud, oh, no. right? Because, because like in The Wizard of Oz, you need that piece of paper from the wizard in order to say that Pythagorean theorem, right? Well, I'll put it this way. I've, I'll, I know cartoonists who are great with color, um, and uh, I'll do a page, and I feel pretty pleased with myself. And then I'll look at something they did, and I go, I would have never thought of that. I know what I, I, what I've done is horrible. Like then the <laughs> falsehood of what I've done is so apparent to me. It's like, no, it all lines up. What they did is perfect. I get it. And I wouldn't have been able to generate that idea ever. There's our summary statement for the episode, everybody, is that the, you, there's no escape from the despair. Is that what you're telling <laughs> us, Chris? Yes. That's, that's my life. <laughs> Oh, that's awful. But, you know, I mean, at the same time, I think I think we've done a decent enough job of defining your sense of gentle courage in pursuing this thing and the kind of analysis and critical thinking. I want to give you a chance for the last word before we kick into book recommendations because Aaron Helm here of the Ann Arbor District Library. But anything else that we missed that you wanted to make a note of, Chris? Anything you want to give a shout out to? Uh, gosh, no. I give a shout out to you for uh, doing uh, such a thorough job and a, and a great podcast. I've enjoyed Aww. myself enormously. Oh, now, I you hope so. feel uncomfortable. Uh, well, actually, no, no, I'm, that's one of those ones I'm going to put in my pocket because, uh, you know, like I said, I've been enjoying your shows for many, many years and uh, I came along later and uh, I, I have at times thought, well, how would Chris deal with this? So, uh, you know, that's kind of nice to hear. That's a T-shirt. <laughs> WWKD. <laughs> not not what, would, what would Chris do, but what would Chris think of this? <laughs> How about what has Chris done? That's what I asked. What, <laughs> what shall become of us now? What has Chris done? So, okay, we're going to do book recommendations to close out the show. Um, Aaron Helmrich. Hey, oh, your mic's My not mic. on. There we go. There You're we on go. the mic All right. Of the Ann Arbor District Library, comics.adl.org. Good to see you. Good to see you. It's been a couple episodes since we yes. last hung out. Been to Arizona and back in the time. Yeah, uh, yeah, Tucson in the summertime, nice. Yeah. Or no, wintertime, rather, <laughs> yep. not summertime. Um, so what do you got for us to talk well, about? I've got a few books. I just wanted to start out with um, more, just because I think it's interesting that they're doing these, um, taking the classic little prints, and they've started doing graphic novels, and they've broken mm. them up into lots of different um, little chunks. So a lot more action and a lot more like planetary, you know, kind of adventures where they're actually traveling around. To different, not the art surfaces. style you imagine when you think of the little prints. No, no, right? no. more so of like an animated look. Yeah, so definitely going for a different crowd. Um, but I've noticed that they've this is the kids' version, and they've also um, started doing a more like longer versions of graphic novels as well. Mm. And so then, that's from Graphic Universe. Yes. Yeah. And then this one is a cute one, Glitter Kiss. It's sort of a take on. All the teen romances, but this one, after a bad romance, the girl goes to see a fortune teller, and she does something, like lays a spell on her, so that when she kisses certain people, strange things happen. The art um, style kind of reminds me a little bit of Faith Aaron Hicks. Yeah, that's what so anybody who's a fan of Friends thinking. with Boys would probably exactly. dig this. Yeah. Okay. So. And who put this out? Who's this is publisher? by Oni Press. Oni Press. Press. Cool. Yeah. So Glitter Kiss. Glitter Kiss. And that's in the library's collection? Yes, is very shortly by Adrian Ambrose and Monica Gallagher. That'll be in the show notes. And then um, Zed by... Um, Cosmic Tale. Michael Gagney. This looks adorable. Apparently, you know, it was serialized just as a comic, and now it's all together. Mm -hmm. um, it's about a little Martian named Zed who has all kinds of um, travels. But this one has a definitely... Um, Softer art style, yeah. Than, you know, it's like a, it's a soft gray tone. Yeah, look. 
Yeah. I mean, people could see it on the video, but I'm describing it for the folks who are yeah. listening in the audio version. Um, but definitely looks like a good one for. So what, what, what age group is this? Because this looks like it's more aimed at kids. This is definitely aimed at kids. So I'm going to say it's probably like like early, mid-elementary. Uh, it actually says rated T for teen. I'm putting it in the youth collection. Because um, Ann Arbor kids are progressive. Yeah, so we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so Zed by Michael Gagne. And then the last one is just kind of a funny... Um, for all the people really upset about the Downton Abbey season um, finale, finale um, you can now do Downton Meet Zombies uh, um, with the, the Dead, dead War- the new Dead Wardians. Um, it's pretty hilarious. It actually has... This is from Vertigo. Seriously... Um, you know, doubting scenes of eating and drinking and whatnot. <laughs> doubting <laughs> scenes of eating. And yes. <laughs> the upstairs downstairs stuff. Exactly. <laughs> and then it's really not until the final page that in the, the first collection, yeah, at any rate. That the, uh, oh, the action really starts going. So, if you you know maybe want to see a couple of those dead characters come back to life, then. You can start ah, that new up. Dead Guardians, and this is, will also be in the library's collection. <laughs> yes. Now, I want to introduce Aaron to Chris because Chris Aaron is the central or the the, the selector mm-hmm. for the graphic novels yep. in the Ann Arbor District Library, and we got to get some of your collections. In oh, absolutely! I, I, I'm not sure if we have any yet. I'll but, take a look. But yeah, uh, so what what book would you recommend that Aaron stock immediately? Oh gosh, of yours. Of my stuff of or your general? stuff? Your stuff. Oh man, um, there was all so bad. <laughs> you know, we've talked about this already, but I hate all my work. I, uh, I just want to crawl into a hole. Oh uh, no, there's, there's none that um, is. Uh, I'm, I'm scanning my my memory. I mean, all all five of my um, Star Slip books are available, um, and that's a completed story. Okay. That's seven years of science fiction that I've done. Um, it's not a single book though. I haven't done that yet. We can buy multi volumes. Yeah. Oh, actually, yeah, yeah, no, uh, and that's not a problem. And and See, it, go ahead. Chris. I came all I came all queued up with uh, with other uh, people's books. Book recommendation. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I only I only have two, and one of them is not a graphic novel. It's just a book. Oh <laughs> no! Then what is it? What is it? Oh, for the well, number one, let me get the graphic novel out there. Um, it's the one that I mentioned earlier. It's uh, Bardem, the Super Realist by Max. I love that book. I love the style of it, and I love the tone of it. Because it's very, very philosophical, um, and and explores uh, that uh, that side of thing. I mean, he he plays a lot with the idea of uh, artists from the from the twenties. The, the conceit of the book is that this man has inherited the um, Dadaist powers of all of these these artists since past, uh, and what does he do with them? But it's not a necessarily a story. It's all very self-contained, just little thoughts about religion and exploring the self and things like that. And it's just really delightful. It's not mm-hmm. a word I use very often, but I really, really love that book. I got it written down. So uh, Bard and the Super Realist by Max. Is it, actually, it's probably pronounced Bardin because it's one guy's name. Oh, yeah. oh, Bardin. Oh, not oh, Bard and Bardin. Yeah, Bardin is what it looks like in oh. in our in our language. Bardin, super yeah. realist. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, but but then, what was the other one that you had? Oh well, the other one was just straight up uh, is short stories. Um, I love the author, um, uh, Stephen Milhauser, and the reason is I actually prefer him to Lovecraft. I mean, since we were talking about horror, um, but he's contemporary. He's he's modern guy. But he writes about things in an unnerving way, and he, the way he does it is in each of his short stories, he builds a pattern with the express purpose of not breaking the pattern, but progressing the pattern until he, the thing goes way off the rails. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he's, he did a short story. One of his books is called The Knife Thrower and other uh, stories. But it's about a... Uh, it's a the Knife Thrower is a short story about a a celebrated knife thrower, a circus artist who comes to town to do a performance and he, uh, his knife throwing is exacting. It's perfect. And everybody is stunned with how well he can throw this, these knives. And he, and he asks at the end of his show, thank you for enjoying it. Uh, would anybody like to receive a, a, a memento for the evening and uh, come receive the knife thrower's mark? And the audience is like, I don't know. what that? And somebody's like, I'll take it. And, he's, and so he goes up to the board. He throws the knife and just 
cuts him so delicately right there, puts a scar on him. And just remember, enjoy your time. Would anybody like to receive a more permanent mark? And somebody agrees. And it's like, no, where is this headed? <laughs> where is this headed? But it's always, it's more subtle than it is horrible. It's very, very subtle stuff. And I really, really enjoy it. Wow. So Stephen yeah. Milhauser. Uh, what, what? And it's not all horror either. It's 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 slice of life stuff. It's it's uh, there's hmm. probably no monsters in the book whatsoever. Well, well that. <laughs> well, that is, not that I could tell. Well, that's cool. That's cool too. I mean, like one of the things we hinted at or kind of uh, walked around a little bit earlier was this idea of looking at other people's other cartoonists' work and despairing, but uh, also like reading. I imagine you're a pretty well-read guy. You probably read a lot of other things beyond comics and it, it, having as many interests as you do, uh, and that can be enormous. Uh... <laughs> I also came with a great album you might like, uh, <laughs> some painters you may want to check out. Uh, well, a stock car racing track that's really nice. Well, uh, art, art history is one of your, your fields of interest, is it not? I mean, this kind of tr trickled into Starslip a little bit. I actually was with Starslip. I was less interested in art history and more interested in a venue to apply criticism. Ah. The idea of the critique and the review is what I wanted to explore because I got upset at the idea of reviewers writing reviews to sound smart. Mm. Um, and you just, in order to explore that, I had to have something to write about. Yeah. And it had to sound a little pretentious. So it ended <laughs> up being art history, which then I ended up being legitimately interested in. <laughs> But yes, so. this this is why we should get Star Slip for the collection Absolutely. at the library. Um, it's pretty pretty funny and intelligent stuff. So um, uh, also, should we give a, a shout out for the Machine of Death Kickstarter? Is that still going or is that done? Oh, no, it's still going. Um, I, I mean, it made its. Uh, I mean, you go on Kickstarter, you can search Machine of Death, um, yeah. and I think it's still got like twenty five days left. But it made its goal in the first twenty four hours. It's a card game that's been. Uh, developed by David Malky of Wondermark, uh, Ryan North of Dinosaur Comics, uh, and myself. Um, and yeah, just check it out. We've got we're we're far into stretch goals, but uh, we had a lot of fun making it, and uh, it's it's a good time. <laughs> And now I'm interested in making games, so thanks a lot, guys. Oh, no, another another one. But yes, uh, <laughs> David was on the show uh, a long time ago. Episode 14, he came on. From, I think it was our very first episode recorded out of the library, and we were talking about the Machine of Death project, and it's, it, it started out as a series of short stories about mm -hmm. a machine that gives you a card that says how you're going to die. It, I think it gives you the date, too, right? No, it oh. just gives you a like a single word... Yeah. Uh, description of how you're going to die and it does and it's and it's uh the machine is has a sense of humor of sorts so if it says old age you don't know if it means your old age you don't know if it means an old man comes and kills you tomorrow right. uh but there's a lot of i mean they're they're writing the or they're editing the second anthology now uh it really blew up for uh those guys it was incredible so when we started to do david approached me to do this this card game project with Machine of Death, and I was very excited to be a part of it. So, yep, there's reason enough to participate is to, because you have uh, a card in the game, or more than one card. I did the I did the art for the cards. And, oh, all uh, the cards. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, right now we are, and this is always built into the game, uh, or put into the Kickstarter. Um, as we progress in the stretch goals, we'll get more and more artists to contribute uh, their cards to it. Um, and so there'll be a lot of web cartoonists in there. Yeah, I saw Casey Green was possibly or is doing a card as as of one of the by, by now he probably is on the line to do it. <laughs> it's, it's doing it's, it's doing well. It's done very well, yeah. Yeah, so congratulations to you guys on that. Um but yeah, we'll we'll put a link in the show notes to the Kickstarter as well. So uh Chris, thank you so much for this really, really fun conversation. I had a good time. Yeah. Thank you. No, this was amazing. I you have made an even stronger fan today. Oh wow! Look at you. So this is this is good stuff. <laughs> come, come on. Now I need to do this. this. This is good. You should keep going. Oh, thanks. Well, cool. Well, uh, anything else that you want to shout out to people besides Brood Hollow today that they should go check out today? Um, that's really the only one. But okay. uh, if you uh, have difficulty keeping track of what I do. Go to my hub, which is chrisdraub.com, and that's that's about all I can tell you. It's the most concise way I can express it. Uh, Aaron, anything going on at ADL that you wanted to shout out about before we close? Um, school's out this week, so I've got lots of crafts going on, so mm -hmm. not so much comic stuff. Today is 
making shrinky dink buttons for your clothes. Mm. And, and that's downtown? O'clock. No, it's going to be at Mallet's. Mallet's yes. Creek, 7 o'clock tonight. And that you can find that in the events yes. engine at uh, yes. ADL.org. Just come keep warm and busy while you're out from school. I got two things I want to shout out. The MSU Comics Forum is coming up in Lansing, Michigan. Comicsforum.msu.edu. That's March 2nd. There's going to be, it's basically a comics conference one day. A whole bunch of really interesting talks and an artist alley. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be on a panel with uh, a bunch of different cartoonists. Then March, what is it? 16th. Mini Comics Day. Uh, that, that you can get to it by going to comicsagreat.com slash mini comics day 13, or you can go to lib.umich.edu slash mini comics day. Uh, all day long, we're going to be making mini comics together. Uh, Phoebe Glockner's class is coming to that. I'm going to be there. Yeah, and it's just, it's uh, participate in this wonderful thing called mini comics where you try to make a story in like six hours, eight hours, and you get to go through that horrible hump in the first third of it where you realize I'm a hack, I'm no good. This is where everybody finds out just how <laughs> truly bad my storytelling is. And then you push through and you make it through the end. You go, hey, this kind of looks like a thing. It's not so bad. But you get to go through that with a bunch of other cartoonists. So will she be there with her class then? Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. And there's food. So uh, you can follow Dave Carter, who's putting this thing together. He's at uh, Dave Reads Comics on Twitter. Um, but you can also just go to uh, lib.umich.edu slash day for more details. It will be linked in the show notes. This March 16th, you should be there. So, okay. Thank you to the Ann Arbor District Library for putting the show together every two weeks. Thank you to Matt Dubay, who I'm prematurely aging every time we do this show with all the technical hiccups and setup. Thanks to Eric Closter in the chat for collecting all the links as uh, as Chris and I were blasting them out. Uh, if you guys want to follow along with the chat, the chat in the future, it's at webchat.freenode.net, channel CAG. Next time we've got Tin Fam. Uh, we're going to talk about his book, Sumo, from First Second Books. And then after that, we've got Sally Carson, who's going to talk about UI, UX design, and how it relates to comic storytelling. So we've got two great episodes coming up, and those are, oh, what is that? March 6th is Tin, uh, Tin Fam, and March 20th is Sally Carson. So you should show up live so you can participate in the chat and ask your questions on the show. Thank you again, Chris. Super fun. What a pleasure. Thank, thank you so much for having me. And thank you, Aaron. Thank you. And yeah. thanks, everybody, for downloading listening. The show will be uh, archived at comicsagreat.com slash CAG73. Until next time, I have been Jersey Drozd of comicsagreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye. <laughs>